Boom. All right, we are live. So once again, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. My name is Edward. I am president of the Chicago Ornithological Society. Welcome to Birds and Bites, um, this program series we've been doing virtually for the last couple of months now. Um, this is obviously a riff on our program, Birds and Beers, which we used to do in a local brewery, uh, usually once a month. Obviously, we can't really be doing that right now. So in the spirit of this evening, uh, we are highlighting a partner brewery as part of this program. Um, please also, as we're going along here, continue to put where you're hailing from in the chat and what you may be partaking of this evening. But on that note, I'm going to quickly pass it over to Francis, who will introduce our partner brewery for the evening. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't quite have the background to work, but we are featuring Forbidden Root. <laughs> um, and they're a great brewery um, located in both Chicago and Columbus, Ohio, in case anybody's tuning in from there. Um, they were founded in 2016, and they're the first Chicago brewery dedicated to crafting or uh, bot botanic beers um, using all natural ingredients. So a lot of their beers have plants infused in them, which is really cool. Um, their draft menu changes frequently, so definitely check out their website to see, you know, what's in for the week. And if you're tuning in from either Chicago or Columbus, you can go ahead and do curbside pickup. Um, they're also open patio only in Chicago. Um, and yeah, I think you should definitely check them out. They're a great, a great business, a great local business to support. And yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Francis. Um, another quick thank you also to our friends at Chicago Audubon Society and Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, who are also uh, supporters of this program series. And uh, just a quick side note for those of you guys who haven't been on social media today, I'm sure you're all wondering. Um, we just got word this morning that Monty and Rose's eggs have begun to hatch at 10 a.m. this morning, and we now have three plover chicks fully hatched, uh, waiting on that number four, lucky number four. So sorry, I just had to distract with that good news. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into our program here. Uh, we have a fantastic group uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce them real quick. So uh, as I call your name here, if you want to, you know, just wave at the camera or so everybody knows who you are. Uh, we first have Martha Harbison has been birding for most of her life. In addition to being the, their life, excuse me. In addition to being the vice president of the Feminist Bird Club, they are a journalist for National Audubon Society and are one of the co-founders of Audubon's LGBTQ affinity group. They will manufacture any excuse to get out of the office to take someone birding, don't we all? The Galbatross Project has given them an entirely new excuse to not shut up about birds. Next up, we have uh, Perbita Saha, is a science journalist at, and Bergen County Audubon chapter member and volunteer. She's a former editor at Audubon magazine and current editor at Popular, Popular Science. Her love of feathers emerged from an ornithology class at the University of Connecticut, where she also studied caterpillars and other insects. Today, she's proud to bird dirty, dirty jurors and carry out the Galbatross project in her home state. Welcome, Perbita. Next, we have Joanna Wu, is a project manager and avian biologist with the National Audubon Society. She has been working on climate science projects and before coming to Audubon, surveyed for forest bird, birds in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. Joanna is passionate about supporting underrepresented voices at Audubon and in science. Thanks for being here, Joanna. Next up, we have our own Stephanie Bilkey, is the Conservation Science Manager at Audubon Great Lakes and a board member of the Chicago Ornithological Society. And I'll go ahead and add, she is now our newly minted treasurer as well. Her work at Audubon focuses on overseeing bird monitoring projects that inform wetland conservation across the Great Lakes. She is passionate about bringing attention to fascinating birds in places that are often overlooked, including female birds, secretive marsh birds, and underbirded nature preserves of the Chicago region. Thanks for being here, Stephanie. And last but not least, we have Brooke Bateman, is a mother, a nature lover, and a scientist. She received her PhD in ecology and conservation from James Cook University, and since has focused her research on the intersection between climate and wildlife. She is a senior scientist, cli scientist climate at the National Audubon Society, and also serves as the director of the community science program, Climate Watch. The Galbatross Project has allowed her to share both the world of birding and the importance of representation in science with her young daughter. They can often be found birding together on Long Island, New York. Thank you so much for being here. 
All right, so we've got an awesome killer group with us here today. I'm gonna to say awesome a lot. You better get used to it this evening. Um, and without further ado, I'll go ahead and get in our first question here. I bet everybody's at this point wondering what the heck is a Galvatross? What is that? What's behind that? So can you guys tell us about how you guys meet? Where did this idea come from? Pervita, do you wanna take that? <laughs> sure. Uh, so, the Galbatrosses predate the name the Galbatrosses, but essentially last spring, um, I was kind of itching to do the World Series of Birding, which uh, for anyone who doesn't know is this really wild uh, competitive 24 hour birdathon in Cape May, New Jersey, and people from all across the world come to uh, take part in it uh, every May. So, but I, felt like just straight birding wouldn't really be the way to do it, uh, especially as someone who is not an expert birder. Um, so I started talking to uh, Stephanie and Martha, who uh, were my colleagues at the time, and we decided to try the World Series of Birding, and Brooke, sorry, um, in a very different light, uh, which was only counting female birds. Um, so we didn't you know, to hell with whatever our species count would be, we would find those female birds and we would make a statement. Um, so along with that, we decided we needed a kick-ass name. And after much, many, many puns, um, Stephanie came up with the Galbatrosses. So that became the team name. Um, and it's eventually spun out into something larger. And of course, Wisdom, the Lace and Albatross out of Hawaii, who is what, like 70 years old now? She's a bit, she's a bit of an inspiration there. I think everybody can agree that's a pretty awesome role model uh, for any endeavor. So, you know, that seems on the surface like a very simple thing, just counting female birds. But, you know, it seemed we, I know you guys did a lot of research getting into this. Um, some of them are really obvious. For example, a kingfisher, there's a very obvious uh, orange wash on the belly that distinguishes those two birds, the male and the female. Um, but for a lot of birds, it's not so obvious. And for some, you know, a lot of them are considered not really possible to tell apart. What kind of research went into figuring this out and uh, getting your, your, uh, your count? Stephanie, do you want to take that? Because you were the one that, I think it was between you and Brooke, came up with the original spreadsheet uh, to figure out exactly which birds that we could actually see in Cape May. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can start out, but I know, Martha, you have a lot of stories to add to this, too. Um, but yeah, we, we started doing some research ahead of time, which um, I, I had a, a bit of a challenge as never being uh, has never have been to, as I have never been to Cape May before or birded in New Jersey ever so I didn't really know what to expect and um, parts of it were a little bit of a letdown for finding female birds just due to the timing <laughs> but um, I just started compiling all the species that I could think of right away and um, they're thinking about what would be there for sure and like what what are the most obvious and maybe not so obvious birds that I could think about. And um, one of them uh, was something that I collected from uh, just uh, work, working at a banding station. I discovered that there is a little known secret about telling the sex of a European starling by the base of the bill color. And it's only visible in the spring, but the, the male has a blue, uh, kind of washed to the base of the bill and the female actually has kind of a, a pinkish, pinkish, peachish color. So I, you know, added that to our spreadsheet and we started going over photos. Another one that was, uh, that I learned from bird banding was cedar waxwing, where the male has a dark black throat and the, the female has a, just a little bit of black um, below the bill. And um, uh, Brooke, do you want to add your, your research too? Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, work commitment kept me from going and attending the World Series, but I participated at home and I had done some research and um, just kind of the depths of the, the internet. And I found a really interesting, um, a woman who had worked really closely with Blue Jays and she had 
talked a lot about how they, ha they have behavioral differences. And so two of the things that she pointed out was that the males will feed the females um, food as they're sort of initiating their nests. And, and it's only the males that will feed the females. And then the other thing was that the females make this really distinctive growl call and it's only them. And so on the day of the World Series, I actually got a female Blue Jay making that growl call. And I got so excited that I could kind of uh, contribute from afar. Also cut to yeah. us like 14 hours into birding, just like scanning a giant starling flock in the middle of Southern New Jersey, waiting to just find the one with the pink, pink face on the beak. That was the most, that was the hardest I've ever stared at starlings. Yes, agreed. Wasn't that also the stuff where we almost got our asses kicked by a peacock? <laughs> <laughs> they Male were wandering or around. Peacock. Uh, that was uh, they were mostly male. male, so so the peacock, not the peahen. Um, but yeah, yeah, I guess like one of the things that I found like really challenging and also exciting. So typically, when somebody does the World Series of Birding, uh, the whole thing like actually goes across the entire state of New Jersey, and people do a lot of. Uh, scouting beforehand. They'll go birding in New Jersey for weeks prior to figure out exactly where the rough grouse is going to be, you know, doing its thing and where there might be barred owls, uh, where there are known heron rookeries, all of that stuff. Um, so we not only had to do some scouting, which, uh, which we did, I did with some friends uh, the, the weekend prior, uh, physical scouting, like where do I drive in Cape May County in order to see birds? especially since I was relatively unfamiliar with Cape May County. But then we like had to spend so much time in the literature, just like asking friends, reading papers. One of the papers we had to like, that we actually referenced during the World Series from, was from 1942. Um, we were trying to figure out whether you could sex, uh, was it house wrens, Stephanie, or Carolina wren? Carolina we saw one wren, of them, yeah. We saw one of them carrying a fecal sack and we're like, oh, it's like, is that a, is that a sex? specific trait, but in fact, nest hygiene is done by both. So we had to take the Carolina run back off our list. Um, but as it turns out, there is so much material out there. It's just none of it's like collected into a, into one spot. So you actually have to like, I mean, Stephanie and I both spent like last year and especially this year, just like elbow deep in pile. There's so much material in, just in pile. <laughs> that, you know, that doesn't even pertain to having birds in, in the hand. Um, for those of you who don't know, Pile is like this two volume um, guidebook for bird banders. And it has all of these crazy like field marks and behaviors and sounds sometimes that never ever show up in a commercially produced field guide. Um, and will occasionally like show up in some of the more uh, dedicated tomes, but it is really like the nerd's nerd's book for birding. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we spent a lot of time in that type of literature trying to find uh, uh, traits that we might be able to see uh, in the field. I think you have to talk about the eye fleck. Oh, well. yeah, I can actually share. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Um, one of the things that we found, um, and I actually dug up the reference papers for this, is that so you think about the American oyster catcher on the East Coast or the black oyster catcher on the West Coast uh, as, mono as monomorphic because they basically look the same. But as it turns out, um, if you look at their eyes, um, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, I don't know if anyone can see this now, but if you look at the American oyster catcher eye, uh, these flecks that you see, this dark dot in the eye is actually sex linked and only females have them. Or if a male has, it's, it's, it's exceedingly small. Um, and it's not just anecdotal, like there are researchers that have gone out for both the American and black oyster catcher populations, and they'll do the observations of whether or not there are eye flecks, and they'll catch those birds, and they took blood from each of these birds and sexed them genetically. Um, and there was something between like a 95 to 97% correlation of these eye flecks with the sex of the bird. So we actually went out and I was like, we found an oyster catcher on the beach in Cape May and it had eye flex. It's like, woohoo, it's true. Um, and that's like, and again, these are like, these are bits of information that are sort of not quite apocryphal, but they're just like, they just sort of like dance through uh, birding circles and ornithological circles, um, but they're not widely known. 
Let me see if I can unshare my screen now. <laughs> wow, that's, that is wild. I, are you able to see that iFlick effectively just through a pair of binoculars? Uh, bins are difficult. Uh, we had a spotting scope on it, so I guess it depends on how close you can get to the bird, but we actually put a spotting scope on it. Wow. Okay, so clearly you guys, you had this idea and you went way into it. You were ready. So come World Series of Birding 2019, tell us about the day of what actually happened. How many birds were you able to get? Were you able to successfully ID as female? We got 31 species. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were some big... All told. Yeah, all told, like we actually had two, we, t we kept two lists. We kept the official World Series list that we submitted as our list. Then we kept an unofficial list of just all the bird species we saw. And I think we ended up with 120 or 130 species total, but only 31 species in which we could definitively identify a female. So many shorebirds, so many shorebirds that we could not sex, <laughs> determine the sex. Yeah, we were just like, uh. so now I'm actually obsessed. I'm like, I'm going to figure out how I can, actually, I found out, well, we, I found out this year that ruddy turnstones actually are not, are, are sexually dimorphic. So I was like, okay, th there might be, you know, that's my goal is for next year is to sex all the shorebirds visually. Um, w two, here you come. Yeah. <laughs> Do it or bust. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, one of those really cool things and then that I wanted, to, I guess it was like really cool is that so with the World Series, there's a WhatsApp group and it's, it's competitive, but it's collegially competitive. And once people started hearing about what we did, like, like this, like the rumor mill just was like, whoa, there's a group here that's just counting the female birds. And so we'd roll up and other teams would be like, are you the Galbatrosses? like how did you guess um yes we are in fact the galbatrosses but people started posting on the whatsapp group hey there's a female it's like there's a female surf scoter that's going past the sea watch at this you know at this intersection on cape may if you if you run you'll be able to find it we went down there got up on the sea watch and sure enough there was a female surf scoter off the off the coast and so they were like go find the bubble links over here and this that whatever so people like it wasn't just us it ended up looking just for female birds, other people started getting into it with us um, while they were doing their own competition. And I thought that was like super cool. I was like, I thought that people were just gonna laugh at us, but they were like, no, this is great. So 31 species. Well, that's totally like first place material, right? Yeah. Not, for like me. at you least wanna, first or second, right? You wanna tell, about, tell us about, tell everyone about our glory. Uh, we can't, so it's, it's great. They really roll out like the species totals. They write them in these on these like giant sheets of paper and put them in front of like this banquet hall so everyone can come look the next morning. Um, so we ended up with the second to last total and just edged out a group of toddlers, like literally four year olds um, who were being driven around by their parents. So it was, it was a big success. Okay, so it, this was clearly a, the journey was the important part here, not necessarily the destination. Um, but what's interesting is that this kind of led to some other, you know, destinations and a sort of a longer journey. So between your infamous 2019 run and then getting to 2020, I assume you guys were going to go for it the same format and then COVID hit. Uh, so what happened between that point and then realizing the World Series in 2020 wasn't going to happen and sort of evolving uh, your idea? Yeah, I think there there was a moment where Perbita had been sending out emails. We're like, we're going to do it again. This is going to be great. We're going to even, you know, make our team bigger. We reached out to to Joanna and um, asked if she wanted to join. And we were kind of having, you know, a multi-geography effort from people from uh, having Joanna from the West Coast, me from the, the, the Midwest, and Martha and Brooke and Perbita from the East Coast all, all joined together looking for female birds again. And then um, things got quiet and we decided, or the, they didn't officially cancel the, the World Series of birding this year. It's still going on, but obviously we, no one was traveling 
no one wanted to make any plans to 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 go to Cape May if none of us live there. Um, so I just reached out and got everyone together and just said like, what are what's next? What are we gonna do? So that's how the conversation started, and we we thought we would do our own event and um, kind of take advantage of being in different places and um, also that we could make our own timeline. So we decided, we decided to do a female bird day event on the last weekend of May. And we were all gonna go out at the same time and ID female birds, but we also wanted to include other, everyone else in our, our fun experiment too. So we opened it up to the public and said, go out and find female birds, tell us what you find tag us on social media. And I don't know, does anyone know how many our group found so far? We got a list going. It looks like we have 62 species this year. So exactly double of last year, probably attri attributable to the different geographies that we birded in. So um, that's exciting. But I, I think what's more exciting to me is that we really, it really felt like we publicized this effort even more this year than last year and made it kind of like an educational tool. Um, most birders, myself included, before this didn't think about whether the birds we were seeing were female or male, as long as you saw a bird of that species, it was like, check, cool. It's hard enough sometimes just to ID a bird to species. Um, and let me tell you, I have to spend like five times longer looking at each bird to try to see if I can figure out its sex. And then hearing calls, some of the calls are not dim dimorphic. So um, it was kind of, it definitely felt like a setback to not be able to list that species just because I couldn't tell the, the sex. Um, but it, yeah, like I said, it was just really rewarding because um, well, female birds are, are generally overlooked in the ornithological community because the males are flashier and brighter. Ken Kaufman has a really good article about this that I'll drop in the chat. Um, and then not only that, but this has really important conservation implications. So despite the fact that females and males sometimes use different habitats, especially in winter, there was one study down, done on wintering grounds in Central America that golden wing warblers use different elevation habitats based on their sex. But all of what we know is based on what the male golden wing warbler uses. So we're actually not protecting the habitats that the females use and kind of overlooking half of the birds there with on their wintering habitat. Yeah, and to add to that, the, the female birds in Honduras, uh, where Dr. Bennett was studying them, they, they actually lost twice as much habitat than the males did because the males were a little bit further up in elevation and they, they once they figured this out they actually found that like two-thirds of vulnerable migratory birds the males and females use different habitat in the winter but only like one or less than one in ten conservation plans actually accounted for that and so there's this huge discrepancy in the protection that the females are getting compared to the males and so that has that has really big conservation implications uh, for the protection of these species so that's interesting. Uh, yeah, your the implications are kind of amazing when you think about it, especially, I mean, how, I guess the real question here is, how bad is it? You know, in science, sometimes the most important question is not what we know, but what we don't know. Do we have a sense of what we don't know? And if, and if we do, what does that mean for how we approach conserving birds in the future? Yeah, I think it, it shows that there's a lot that we don't know. Um, for example, like only 40% of museum specimen collections are, are females. So they're, there's a, they're underrepresented in those. So our historical baseline of knowledge of birds is, is not there. And then this example of the wintering habitat, that really just shows that um, we're just starting to sort of scratch the surface here. Um, and I think somebody else can probably speak to this a little bit better, but about um, we used to think that female birds did not sing. Um, and Joanna, I know you, you've really worked closely and, and know the, the collaborators of the Female Bird Song. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, before the Memorial Day, Female Bird Day kind of project that we rolled out, I reached out to a couple of the uh, prominent ornithologists studying this. We had Dr. Karen Oldham, who is the creator of the Female Bird Song project. She had been studying female songs in female birds 
um, working in collaboration with Dr. Lauren Benedict, another researcher who's currently based in Northern Colorado. And they went out and recorded a lot of songs as well as dug in the literature. And they pushed for Birds of the World of, with Cornell to list female bird songs separately from males. So now you might see that in some of the accounts and that was much thanks to their pioneering effort. And they found that in, in species that we know of song information, 64% of birds um, have females that sing and 36% um, of species, in 36% female song is absent. So a great number of species of what we know have female bird song, right? And then that's the question of what do we not know? That's, that's, that's what they're trying to, they're starting to discover now is that we don't know a lot. Um, but let me see here, in another study led by Lauren Benedict, they found that 144 species of birds in North America have female bird song, including stuff like Eastern Whippewee, um, a lot of wrens like canyon wren, house wren, winter wren, a lot of finches, song sparrow, fox sparrow, N Nelson sparrow, Wilson's warbler, and I can't tell you what the female bird songs are like because I, I don't I had trouble finding them online, but um, it's just incredible what we we don't know and what they're they're finding out. And I so think northern oh sorry I was gonna no. say northern Go cardinal is one of the species as well, and that's like a readily accessible one you can check out in your own yard or local park and yeah kind of really take time to see what the females sound like or hear sorry yeah it'll be that one where it's, you think that you're like I, I recognize that sound but I don't quite recognize it um and it's really loud and you're like could that be a, a wren of some type and as it turns out every time that I've like had that experience it's always been a female cardinal so they are loud, they have very distinctive calls that are very different from the male. So it sounds like while there's certainly quite a dearth of information, there is still a, a, quite a bit out that's out there, but it's kind of floating around in different places, different books or different guides, or even just sometimes in people's heads. Um, what, what are we doing to sort of address that now? How do we make that more accessible for the larger public and birders as a whole to start understanding these, at least what we do know? Jeff, you want to take that? Or Parita? Um, I, can, I can get us started, but so that was kind of our bigger vision with this female bird day, which wasn't really a day, it was a weekend, and it's not really a weekend, it's forever, we hope, whenever people are out birding and seeing, you know, potential breeding females or wintering females. Uh, so we ended up evolving from the Galbatrosses to the Galbatross project because we want this to be a community-wide effort where we're collecting these little bits of information, you know, whether people have anecdotes, whether they come across a cool study, or, you know, are just talking to some, like, six-year-old birder at their Audubon chapter and just get, like, a little nugget of info we would love to collect that in a public space. And I know someone asked um, if we could share a spreadsheet of what we'd seen from that weekend. So like, that's what we're building right now. Um, we're going through some of the different observations that people had and trying to start build out this like library of information that everyone can access in one spot. Um, and you know, it's a privilege to have scientists on the team because we're really going to have to vet this information somehow. Um, but yeah, it'll it'll be out there for everyone. We have um, Stephanie. Maybe Stephanie can talk more about how submit we submit observations. But um, yeah, this is this is meant to be you know a library for all. Sure. Yeah. And um, Joanna just linked our form in the chat, so it's a Google form. And we welcome everyone, anyone and everyone to submit any kind of female bird ID or documentation that you have. And um, basically you select the North American species of interest and then let us know, do you, is it 
um, a physical trait? Is it a sound? Is it a behavior? Or also just tell us, I know the species exists and we don't know any differences between the male and the female because that's of interest to us too. Because I, I think one of the questions that kept coming up is like, how many species are truly dimorphic? Do we even know? Um, and you know, some of those some of those little things just need to be pulled out, like these really interesting behaviors. And that's that's one of the things that we started to look at too when we were when we were doing our research and when we were out in the field is is pulling out like, oh, so only the female is incubating in this species, or only only the female has, um, you know, this other kind of behavior that you can see during nesting season. Um, and so we want to know what those traits are and when you can see them, because we also know that there's a lot of species that um, the, the females are identifiable, but sometimes, depending on the season, they can be easily confused with the male. And um, that happens a lot with um, species like American red stars, and there's a few other warblers that I got to have fun with when we were out in the out in the field for female bird day. Um, there's there's a, some of those species where people think that they they know which one is the female, but then um, there's these uh, the American red star young male keeps a plumage that looks very much like the female until its second year. So during spring, you'll see female red stars and you'll see young male red starts. And, um, you know, we're, we, we do have the tools to know which is which, but um, some of that information isn't, isn't always easily available because sometimes in a field guide, you only get like one picture of the male, one picture of the female. So if you're looking at a red start, some of the things that I look for is the, the young males still will have like kind of splotchy bits of black on them in the in the spring and the the yellow color that's on the armpits and on the tail is usually a little bit more tinged orange where the the female is uh, paler and that's that's kind of the trend across the board especially with warblers if you find a really f pale fem uh, pale bird then it's likely to be female unless it has some kind of other plumage variation which just makes everything more fun <laughs> If, if we're only, if it wasn't complicated. <laughs> I was just going to say, if we're only depending on plumage as a field mark to sex birds, like it's all over for us in fall. Like when those, when the field is just full of young males and females, like we are doomed unless we're looking for other clues out there. So yeah, you can't be a one season birder. I think one of the things that I noticed and Stephanie has talked about this a little bit, you know, with like behaviors, it's really hard to like read books and just absorb that information to remember all these species. Of course, these are the ones that the females like incubate and this, that, whatever. But when you see it in the field and then you corroborate it with research later, it sticks. So now I know conclusively that Eastern Kingbird females, they're the only ones that gather nesting material. So I found an Eastern Kingbird with nesting material and then like looked into the literature and they're like, yep, only females build nests. And I was like, that's great. And yellow warblers are the same way. Um, and I actually did see, I did find a yellow warbler gathering, uh, gathering nesting material as well that same weekend. Um, so I think that one of the great things about doing female bird day is that it's a targeted way to learn about female birds that doesn't feel like homework because it's applied and it cements that, it basically cements the lesson in your head much better than if you just like kept flipping through a book. Um, so it's okay if you're out there and you don't actually get the ID at the time, just make a note of it and then come back. So a lot of this identification actually have for me, especially like happened at home after I had like made some pretty extensive field notes and this, that, whatever. And I came back and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm corroborating that what I saw is actually what I thought it was. And there were multiple times where I'm like, no, actually that, you know, both sexes do this type of behavior or make this type of call. And I had to take it off my list. Um, but I found that, you know, birding this way is a different way to bird. Um, but I found it immensely uh, satisfying and instructive. And it, Joyful. It, I had it, so much fun. <laughs> it makes us better birders, too. Yeah, I'll bet. Geez, I'm, I'm really, actually really looking forward now to actually testing myself out here in the field because I know I'm going to suck, but you know, it's worth the challenge, it sounds like. So 
that kind of begs the question, what's next? What is the future of the Galbatrosses and the Galbatross project? Where do you see yourselves going with this? That's a great question. I think we're, we're, I love thinking about, you know, how can we promote this and people like you and Ken Kaufman promoting Female Bird Day. Ken wrote an article that was shared many times about how he became a better birder when he focused on females and not just the males. Um, so I think it's catching more attention just in birding circles. That's a really important first step and I appreciate each one of you being here to learn more about female birds and why we shouldn't overlook them for both conservation purposes and as, as you know, if we want to become better birders. Um, and then I, I, we would like to finish really tallying and vetting our own list and then go through all the tweets that people have tagged the female bird day hashtag and see what other people have been seeing. Some were shared across the world, which is really cool. So we want to compile a big list. And also there's the goal of working on that um, guide from all the tips that uh, we hope to get about how to identify female birds. And, and then I think somebody mentioned trying to do one in the fall, which is just going to be so much harder. <laughs> But hey, that's the way to improve, right? We, we did have a lot of people ask if we were gonna do more female bird days. And I think that we'll, we'll certainly have that in the works. I think it's something that needs to be ongoing. And yeah, let's challenge ourselves to get it in different seasons. That would be an awesome challenge. Just gonna say, I'm sure COS would be happy to run a weekend of Chicago fall female birding. Just saying it now. Um, seeding the ideas. So, all right. So I think last thing here before we turn it over to people's questions, um, and you've sort of peppered this through throughout your presentation so far, but how can people get involved? What's the best way for people to start supporting your project and, you know, getting invested in this and learning and just generally becoming part of the Galbatross project? Get out and bird. <laughs> Oh, it's so I mean, simple on the surface. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, obviously, it's like you can like hit us up. Um, you know, all of us are available on social media. But really, it's about like, you know, uh, going out and just start ask yourself or like, you know, set a goal for yourself. I want to I want to identify one female bird a day. You know, um, I have been sort of trapped in a Brooklyn apartment uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. Uh, so I've been doing only window birding. So I actually have a brand new like window life list, like only the species I can see out my Brooklyn window. But I've spent, I've spent a lot of time looking for the female birds out my window. Um, I've got three species so far. Um, so even doing even better than 2019 World Series. Um, but I think that that's it. And then tell us about it. We have a hashtag um, that we do monitor. Um, it's, you know, obviously a lot, not a lot of people using it now, but it's just like, uh, yes, yeah, female bird day. Um, or you could, on Instagram, I think we also use uh, uh, galbatrosses. And yeah, just start telling, telling, tell us about the female birds that you see. Talk to other people. You know, there are a lot of people out there, I think, and I think, this is a birding community, so I'm sure that you already know there are like people out there that won't like count a bird on their life list until they see the mail. I mean, you could have a difficult conversation with somebody like that. Um, I highly encourage people to look at the Female Bird Song Project and the actual research that's going into um, trying to close up some of these knowledge gaps around female birds. Um, and again, like talk to your talk to your peers. Um, this is really a, I see this as really a crowdsourced sort of, um, not ad hoc, but really an ad hoc project um, that we just happen to sort of be, you can nucleate around like what, what we do, but we're really trying to invite as many people in as possible. Yeah, and I, and I think it's really important for, for us to, to get crowdsourced information on how you identify female birds. So just between us that were on the original Galbatross team, we found our, our bird information from like so many various sources and we're just a, a limited set of people. So if, if, even if it's just how do you tell a northern cardinal male from female, we want to hear it all. We want to know what, what your clues and tips are because the more uh, voices we get on this, the, the more information we're going to have for this. So definitely share your tips, please. And if you're um, 
a skilled photographer or even a subscriber to Worst Bird Pick, um, it would be great if you, yeah, like when regarding bird life, you're, you also take photographs of the less flashy birds and get that visual representation of female birds. Like that was one of my favorite things about the hashtag was, um, you know, my feed is often filled with birders and what they're finding in the field. And for this one weekend, it wasn't the typical, you know, black-throated blue warbler that that name is designated for. Um, it was the female black-throated blue warbler. And it's just, yeah, like this, there's this completely different world of sights and senses when you're considering fe the female counterparts as well. Um, and I think visually we can do a lot to represent that. And someone just asked in the chat box about putting the, the sex in eBird. So from my perspective, that is fantastic. So as a scientist who studies climate change, if we don't, it, and we know that birds, female and male birds in the wintering grounds use different habitats, they're, they're likely to be affected by climate change differently. But if we don't have that information in the data, we're not gonna be able to understand that and, and study that. So the more scientific knowledge we can collect on not only how to tell the birds apart, but also where they are is gonna be really valuable information. That's awesome, thank you. Uh, so if you have questions, everybody, now's the time to stick those in the chat so you can ask them. And uh, thank you for answering that question about eBird. That's all. It's a really important one. Um, obviously, every birder everywhere uses eBird now, right? Everybody on this call uses eBird. We're all digital now. Yeah, but any other questions in the chat? Go, and go to gallery view here. I, all right, that's a good one. Uh, do you guys want to answer what your favorite female bird is? It's like asking what my favorite finger is. <laughs> Um, Oyster catcher. <laughs> is that your your favorite female bird? Oh, I I have I don't know. I I think I said in the last one when they asked that it was one of my favorites is cerulean warbler, and that was because I had recently seen the one at La Ba, and I just think they're so beautiful. And I know the the male is is what catches everyone's eye, but I think the female is particularly gorgeous with that kind of like uh greenish like aquamarine color yeah a bird in that family that sort of vein as well as the female painted bunting really one of the most remarkable greens in the bird world um this is not purely north Amer or purely u.s based but um hakanas which are a tropical bird and if you never read or seen one, definitely look them up. They're just wild in many ways. Um, they, the females are kind of the more dominant in terms of like mating and sexual behavior. And they form these harems of males, of their favorite males um, to breed with. And that's just a power move that I, I can never get over. That's great. Um, I mentioned this in, in another uh, webinar, but red-winged blackbirds, female red-winged blackbirds are by fire, like one of my favorites. They just have like such a striking color, like, like just, they just strike me. And, and they're also variable too. Um, and I, I mentioned this last time too, but every year I, I see the first one I see, I'm like, oh my God, what bird is that? Like, I don't, I don't know what, what is that? And is it like a giant sparrow? Um, and then I'm like, oh yeah, it's, it's a, female red-winged blackbird. So they, they're tricky and beautiful, and I just, I think they're amazing. I'm gonna go with the wren tit, because the, they both sound like ping pong balls dropping, but the female doesn't end the same way as the male. So try to listen for it. Um, I'll send a link. Nice. So, sorry, someone asked, do female birds sing for territory or other reasons? I think there there is some research that they do sing for other reasons. I think there's some there's some research out of Australia that showed that the the female birds are actually more likely to be conversing with each other than defending territory. I'm not sure if uh, anybody else on the team knows a little bit more about that, but I remember reading into it that there 
that, that they, they just sort of use their song for, for different reasons. I, I know I've read that um, female birds sing more frequently in the tropics than they do in temperate regions. And that's because um, in, the, in the temperate zone, we have a shorter breeding season and um, a lot of the birds you know, are only on territory during that breeding season. So they really have to condense all their breeding activities and territory upkeep to a, that short time window. So um, the, the females have to do all of the, the nesting and incubation while the male does all the territory defense. And in the tropics, since they're in one location, a lot of these birds don't, that don't migrate and are year round in the tropics. They are defending their territory year round. And um, since that takes up so much time and they also have more time flexible for the actual nesting activities that it takes both pairs to defend the territory. Uh, we got a question, a question from Jeff Williamson. Do you wanna unmute yourself to ask that question? Took me a little while to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I was just curious about, you know, there are various species of birds where there are size differences between males and females. Sometimes the females are bigger, sometimes the males are bigger. And was that something that you that you you felt confident about uh, employing during your World Series or projecting? There, there was one during the World Series. Um, we had a giant peregrine falcon like fly over while we were like picking apart all these shorebirds. And of course, we couldn't ID the fem or any female shorebirds. Um, they all look the same, but um, the, of the species that we were looking at. But um, we were like, maybe it was a female peregrine. We only got a glimpse of it. And then we basically relied on someone else kind of was like, oh, that was a huge peregrine. It was, it was definitely a female. <laughs> So, I mean, that's Good always enough. a judge, judgment call, but yeah. I, I yeah, size is, yeah, size is so hard. And a lot of times I've like, you know, this year when I was out doing uh, female bird day, I did run across a number of, especially raptors, but other species where you see the di size dimorphism. And I actually didn't count them because unless I was like, really, unless I was like, that is a really, really big raptor. There's no, like, you know, you see those really, like a really burly red-tailed auk. You're just like, yeah, that's, there's no way that's gonna be a male. Or when you see a pair and you can see the larger one and the smaller one. But most of the time, no, I actually don't feel confident enough really to like, be like, yes, I am, you know, more than 95% sure that that's one or the other. We got another question from Christian, uh, Kristen Zambo. Would you like to unmute yourself to ask your question? Hi there. Um, yeah, I was curious if there was a specific species of the female that was the most difficult for you to identify. Stephanie, I feel Stephanie, like I feel like story with the with the warbler that you found in the cemetery. Wait, which warbler? <laughs> the Connecticut warbler? Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for reminding me. Um, well, I I I feel like Connecticut warblers aren't too challenging. There, there's a pretty standout dis difference but you know it's all about like getting the perfect look and all the best lighting and I was at a cemetery to see this Connecticut warbler also in Chicago um I, I I'm sure a few other people on this uh call saw it too uh now I'm I'm blanking on what the the cemetery was called but um I, I got such a fleeting look at it because we got there and realized the cemetery closed at four o'clock on Mondays and we got there at like 3.50. <laughs> so I looked at it, I'm like, that, and it was sitting right next to a female black-throated blue warbler, which was exciting because I added another species. And this was during our weekend that we were uh, doing the challenge. And I, I was like, I'm pretty sure that was a female Connecticut because it was just pale. And then um, a few other people posted pictures of the same bird. And depending on the lighting, it looks a little bit darker in one person's picture and then paler in another person's picture of the same exact bird. So that was kind of a, a, a tricky ID. But I think some of the more challenging ones 
that aren't, you know, it goes back to what I was saying before about some that kind of overlap with the female and the young male. Um, so there's some like Robins, uh, for instance, where there is some overlap. So I just try to find like the palest bird I can find and be like, oh, well, that's, that one is definitely a female. <laughs> What, you want to tell about tell everyone about the one that got away? Remember we were standing in that marsh? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that was an interesting one. So this was during the World Series of Birding. Um, I had my first ever experience with a clapper rail, and we were in an area that also overlapped with king rail. And since I wasn't really familiar with clapper rail at all, I, I was just trying to tell if it was a king or a clapper rail and just trying to get that straight. And it was vocalizing. And I listened to both calls over and over again. And I was like, okay, fine, it's a clapper rail. And we like, you know, didn't put it on our list because we didn't think that there was any sexual dimorphism. But then I think like moments after, I was still, I was like on my phone looking at Birds of the World, which is just like this huge encyclopedia of all the North American or all the birds of the world. And um, I found out that the particular vocalization that I heard was actually only the female <laughs> clapper rail. So it was like unofficial number 32 on our list for that day. And you could tell it was just killing Stephanie like the rest of the day because she kept asking other birders like, what, what are the chances that I heard a king rail out there? <laughs> um, and of course we, she just narrowly missed it, but it was still wonderful to find that out afterward. All right, we got uh, two more questions here, and I think that's what we'll do to close it out here. Uh, Katie Tyrell, do you want to ask your question? Uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. I think she said she doesn't have a, a microphone, so I, I'm happy to take that question. Oh, my so bad. That's right. So, so Katie's asking if, uh, advice for undergraduate students wanting to do an ornithology research. Um, I think that's a great question. I have, I have two suggestions and my other colleagues might have more, but um, the first is to see if anybody in your, your university is doing research on birds and, and see if you can go help out uh, any of their grad students on their projects. I did research as an undergrad and it was, it was fantastic. It was a great way to introduce me to getting into science. Um, Alternatively, there's a lot of options to do community science, um, otherwise known as citizen science, but community science projects are happening all over the country. Uh, Audubon runs the Christmas bird count, uh, Climate Watch, and as well as uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count, which we work with Cornell. So if there's a, an Audubon chapter nearby, that's a great way to sort of get introduced to science and to get out there and start studying birds. Um, so that, those would be my two suggestions. Awesome. Uh, and we had a request uh, for Martha to reshare that picture uh, of the um, oyster catcher with the black speck in the eye. I'm trying to get it up in the chat um, and I'm totally failing at this, but honestly, if you just do, do a Google search um, of oyster catcher eye fleck, uh, you'll find a bunch of them. So I apologize for that. Well, on that note, telling you to Google something, I think I'm going to go ahead and close it out here. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. So can I get a huge round of applause, virtual applause, I guess, for our speakers, uh, Martha, Perbita, Joanna, Stephanie, Brooke, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. This has been really, really informative. Um, I'm, I think we're all really excited about seeing where this project goes and generally all improving as birders because of this conversation that you guys are really uh, bringing to the fore. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. This was fantastic. Um, I'd also like to give a quick shout out to Forbidden Root, our sponsored brewery for the evening. Yay! And Chicago Audubon and Peggy Notabar for uh, you guys supporting us on this series. But um, please feel free to head over to chicagobirder.org. We have a lot of excellent events coming up just like this one. Well, let's be real, probably nothing like this one. This was awesome. But there will all be is, you know, pretty awesome events in their own way. Um, and head over to our events page. We've got a lot more Birds and Bites events coming up, including Bird Trivia next week. Um, and again, thank you all so much who joined us this evening. Really appreciate you guys taking time of your evening. And uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your week and your weekend. Have a good night, everyone.